Tom Campbell here. If you find something of significant value in our videos, please consider supporting their production through our Patreon account or through a one-time donation. The links are in the description below. Thank you and enjoy the video. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of our participants in the Fireside Chat around the world. This is our 70th Fireside Chat. Thanks to Oliver in Germany and Justin in California who does the editing. Oliver runs the server. Please remember them if you'd like to chip in on the, the server that is going to be in a link um, in our description. All right, we'll begin today. And thanks, Tom, too, for being here, obviously, the star. <laughs> we'll begin today the question with Boris. Hi, Tom. I had a question about uh, developing a deeper relationship with a larger consciousness system. I was actually wondering that to myself and uh, thinking, okay, what would Tom say? And then I remember that actually I don't have intuition yet. So I wanted to know how we can develop a deeper relationship with the LCS uh, for being like us with, a, I would say, less attuned intuition. Okay. Well, the way to develop a good relationship with the LCS is to be serious about your growing up, to be uh, uh, sincere and working on getting rid of your fear. That's the key thing. Okay, now after that, you can make connections with the LCS. You can, uh, uh, you know, ask questions, have conversation. You can connect in a, in a more overt way. But the LCS is, find, will find you a person of interest if you are in the process of trying to get rid of your fear. That's the key, that's the key thing. And being open to to growing, being open for challenges. Um, you may ask questions about your growth and path and uh, ways of being, you know, how to, how to approach whether what you're doing is satisfactory or is there a, a better way. All of that shows that you're interested really in growing because it's a, it's a thing that, that uh, is very important to you. So that's the way that you make that connection. Now, you may want to uh, have the intent to merge with the larger conscious system, to just experience it, what it's like. Uh, that may not always happen, but if it, if, if it does, that will be a, a, uh, a very profound experience for you. And that probably is on, you know, probably is on your path. It's not something you'd want to do all the time, but it is something that uh, is good to good to experience. Just the the oneness with everything is very good to experience. So that's all. Just be uh, sincere and, and and ask those questions that somebody who's really interested in growing up would ask, or would connect with, or the attitudes of a person who's really um, interested in growing up, you know, would have. So. That's all. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Boris. We will go on to our next question uh, from Carolyn, please. Thank you, Donna. Um, okay, I wanted to um, ask about um, a question that I was interested in for longer because there's a lot of different trainings, trainings and classes with different tools to become a certified therapist in order to help people like hy hy um, hypnosis or psychotherapy or neurolinguistic um, therapy uh, or programming. And um, I was wondering, because uh, you are also a physicist, but because you're very grown up, you are helping people very successfully with their problems. So I just would like to know if all the studying of all those different tools is really necessary or if it's just a better approach if you grow up yourself and then help people intuitively. Well, I think there's value to be gained from from uh, the studying of such of such therapies. They give you 
more tools to use, more ways, you know, more understanding of how to of how to uh, approach people, things to you know, things to connect. As, as you see certain behaviors and actions and so on, you're able to interpret them better if you study these sorts of things. But fundamentally, you can't be a really good therapist or helper of people unless you've grown up some. So if you are mainly driven out of your ego and fear, learning those things will maybe make you mediocre or a poor therapist. Not learning any of those things will make you a terrible, a terrible therapist. But if you grow up first and get some of those skills, then I suspect that would optimize you as far as being able to help people. But the most important part of it is the growing up. It's not the, it's not the facts you know that's important when you're helping people. It's can you really connect with those people? Do you really understand where they're coming from? And are you compassionate? Do you really care about them? Or is your job as a therapist just a job and you do whatever you do and it helps or it doesn't? So growing up is the key ingredient because that helps you understand people. When you grow up to the point that you are getting more information about those people than just what's in the physical world, then that's a very helpful tool in being able to help them because you can feel their feelings, hear their, hear their thoughts. Uh, you can get in at a much deeper level than what they even have the language to share with you. So that makes it, that makes you a pretty good therapist, even if you don't know all of the, all of the details. But knowing those details, knowing those things that these people learn is still helpful. It would probably make you even better therapist. So if I knew all those things, if I knew the, hypno, the hypnosis therapy, what did you say, psychotherapy and NLP, then I might be better at helping people. But I don't know. You know, maybe not. The, the key ingredient is caring, being kind, and getting all your own stuff out of the way, which means getting your fear, getting your ego, and and uh, getting your beliefs out of the way. The problems that come attached to some therapies is that they come with their own set of beliefs. They come with a set of, you know, this is the way the world works. This is the way people are. This is the way people should be. And uh, particularly psychotherapy, because that's one of the oldest of that group. Uh, it comes with a set of beliefs about people. Hypnosis is probably the next oldest and, and, uh, that also comes with a set of beliefs about people and how they work. And if you carry those beliefs with you, then you're going to be very limited into how helpful you're going to be with people. So there, the way to separate the beliefs from the tools that are actually useful, the way you do that is to grow up first. <laughs> it's to get rid of your fear, ego, and, and your own beliefs. And then you can see things pretty much for the way they are. You won't you won't be likely to fall into into beliefs. So does that does that answer your question? I think it could be helpful to know those things, some of the facts. But fundamentally, if you are full of fear, ego, and belief, you're not going to be but so good, no matter how many facts you know. Okay, so it's probably best to if you choose to study those things to also apply the tools on yourself and work with yourself and see if it works. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. And then my, my second question is more of a very personal question. Um, it's about uh, food and fear. Um, like, late, <laughs> I have always been... Um, uh, like I always really loved to eat and I grew up with it as a really normal thing that I could like eat whatever I want. Um, I didn't have any restrictions, but as I, when I got older again, my teenage years and I studied a lot of raw veganism and, uh, nutrition, like I started to create a lot of beliefs and a lot of, um, tension around food. And I've been struggling to find the right diet for me. And um, 
uh, with that came also, I started to suffer from bulimia, which, um, yeah, uh, which was a struggle to um, get over with. But um, like, it has been going very good lately and um, I'm not restricting myself anymore. But it's still like, it's still a struggle to really find the right diet because everybody's saying something different. And also scientific research shows different things than what <laughs> other people talk about. And so also in my dreams of having like, I don't know, sort of fear tests, I, or I can't really, I don't really know what's going on. I have a normal dream of normal things going on and then suddenly there's food and I really enjoy to eat it. it was <laughs> as different types of food, but it's always like um, a part, uh, a part of my dream. So I was wondering if it's, if that could also be connected to fear because it's such a, such a big thing in my life that I was struggling with. Okay, well, things like bulimia are very much fear-based. You know, that's a thing that it depends on, you know, a fear that you have considering your own appearance and the level of satisfaction and positiveness you get from eating and just from taste. And you, you know, if you are concerned about if you eat as much as you'd like to eat because you enjoy eating, then you wouldn't have, you know, the the body that you that you want to have as well. So you've got several things that are um, pushing you in opposite directions. And when you have that going on in your head, you end up with confusion and dysfunction. So the bulimia is definitely fear based. Probably the rest of it is too. It probably has to do with a war between, and you probably have a strong belief that you need to eat just the right foods, and a fear that you're not you're not eating the right foods, because there's so many diets, there's so many uh, uh, people saying eat this, no, not that, eat this, no, not that. You know, there's all this confusion going on because there's lots and lots of diets that are all very different from each other. And you don't know. And because you don't know and it's important to you, then you have the fear that you'll do it wrong. And the fear that you will do it wrong just adds to the confusion and makes it impossible for you to, to feel good about what you're eating. And if you don't feel good about what you're eating, then you're distressed because eating is something that's very enjoyable to you and it's something that you want to do. So you can see how it all kind of gets wadded up in a ball and makes you unhappy and miserable and you can't seem to find your, find your way through that. I would start with working on just a, you know, for work on your fear, your fear of, of what is it that that uh, frightens you most? Is it that you're eating a wrong diet? That you won't enjoy your food? If you eat the diet that's healthy, then it won't be the diet that you really want to eat. That you, you know, you will uh, gain weight and not have the body shape that you want. Let all that fear go and just start with the simple basics. Food. What is it? You know, I've always been I've always been amused by the fact that when you read something from the anthropologist about the way humans were a hundred thousand years ago, they tell you that people used to eat seeds, leaves, fruit, and roots. And you think, wow, that was really must have been horrible eating those things. Like you know, you can kind of have a imagination of a person crawling around nibbling on roots, you know, and uh but think about what it is we eat today. What is the modern diet like? It's leaves, seeds, <laughs> roots. It's the same thing. You know, you eat bread, that's grass seed. You know, it's wheat, which is a grass, and you take the seeds. So if you think about it, the things that we eat now are the same things we ate a long time ago. We've just learned how to configure them in different ways. So. Start with the very basics in your diet. 
fundamentally eat plants, make that the basic of your diet, basically a green diet. Now, whether it's cooked or whether it's raw, well, some of each is probably fine. It doesn't matter that much. As it turns out, raw seems to have maybe a, a little more of the, of the healthy uh, process, but not that much because cooking, it sometimes creates nutrients that won't be there if you don't cook it. So, and raw has some nutrients that won't be there if you do cook it. So you can eat some raw, you can eat some cooked. That's not all that terribly important, but basically live on the same things we've always lived on and do that directly and simply. Let your food be simple and straightforward. And whether you enjoy it, how much you enjoy that food, is something that you create in your own mind. Your level of enjoyment and satisfaction from what you eat is your own creation. If you have an idea that, oh, green things, I don't like green things, well, then you won't like green things. But that's self-created or you pick it up from peers. Um, that can be changed. Learn to like and appreciate those things that are healthy for you. Learn to dislike and don't want those things that are not healthy for you. Things that have very low food value, things that are full of sugar, things that are full of, of, of grease, you know, things that are full of, no, I don't know, things that are just unhealthy. Now, the things that are, that are less healthy now than maybe they used to be, I would, I would put wheat in that category, bread. A lot of wheat now is, is uh, not as healthy as it used to be. Causes problems in the gut. So I would kind of let the carbohydrates go to a large degree. Um, have that a smaller part of your diet. And have the, the plant-based diet, including fruit, a larger part of your diet. I would let most of the meat and, and uh, dairy go as well, the animal-based things. Don't seem to be as healthy, at least that's what the researchers say. Um, so I'd let those go. But now that doesn't mean that you have to let it go altogether, 100%. The part of your diet that's going to affect you most is the part that you eat consistently, day after day after day. That's the stuff that will make you, you healthy or unhealthy. If once in a month you eat something sweet or you have a, you know, you eat other things that aren't as healthy, it's not going to make any difference. It's a, it's a small blip to your body, to your whole physical system. So if there is that something you'd like to have every once in a while, just because that's what you ate as a child and have good thoughts about it or whatever else is going on in your mind, then it's not like, oh, if I eat this, it'll be terrible, you know. Don't be so hard over. Don't be so uh, um, focused on a particular thing being necessary or being right. So just in general, the 90% of the time, eat healthily. Fruits and vegetables, more vegetables than fruit, but fruit and vegetables. Let go of the sugars, and then everything will work out. Your weight will be fine. If you, if you want your weight to be less, then eat less. And actually, this idea of, of eating until you're full isn't such a good idea anyway. You should eat until you're still just a little bit hungry. It's just enough to get you by until the next time you eat. And eventually, you can come to the attitude that being a little bit hungry is a bad thing. You don't want to feel hungry at all, ever, so you just keep eating. And that's not a good thing. Feeling just a little bit hungry is a good, natural way to be, that you are just a little bit hungry. But then when that little bit grows and grows and it's time to eat, then go ahead and eat and then quit before you're full before you can't eat anymore. Don't eat until you can't eat anymore. Eat and still leave yourself just a little bit hungry at the end, and that is a better way to go. So 
don't overeat. We eat way too much. Most of us eat way too much. We push back from the table and we're still a little hungry. That's a good thing. And eventually you'll learn to like that feeling of being just a little bit hungry. That's a feeling of being lean. That's a feeling of having energy. That's a feeling of being able to work and get things done. Because when you eat too much, you feel kind of like you just need to sit down someplace and, you know, you need to take a nap. You need to lie down. It makes you sluggish. It makes you feel um, not very energetic. You know, you eat a big meal and, you know, if you had to get up and do something with a lot of energy, you just couldn't do it. Well, don't get to that point when you eat. Stop before you get sluggish. Stop before you get uh, that, that heavy, lethargic feeling. So that's the things to do. And if you just do those simple things, I think most of these things will sort themselves out for you. But work on the fear, because the fear is at the basis of it, and the fear is what's, is what's driving you. Work on those fears. You can reprogram yourself. You can, you can teach yourself to like things. You can teach yourself to not like the things that aren't healthy for you. Yeah, that's sort of like I'm. I'm really. I became really good at that because of all the raw veganism. Like I, like I can eat anything that I believe is healthy for me. But that's the like that's the problem that I just don't know what's healthy because every time I'm getting, like every time I have a health issue, also people, like a lot of people that are close to me, also telling me that uh, that I should eat meat. Whereas like I became vegetarian ten years ago, and now I started to cooperate integrated into my diet again but i haven't noticed any effects so i was also very confused about that because also um people grew up with meat yes people grow up with meat and and the people who grow up with meat meat is just a natural everyday part of their diet and they think everybody should eat meat uh, eating meat to some small degree if it's a very small part of your diet is probably not going to hurt you Science today says that if more than 30% of your calories come from meat, you have an increased risk of getting cancer. That meat, you know, if you eat a lot of meat, then it's not that healthy. It's not healthy in the gut and it can lead to a lot of problems. Well, we have in our culture now cancer, stroke, heart attacks, that are all the main killers. Those three kill probably 80% of the people, you know, who die from diseases. It's, the, it's one of those three things. Those are the three big killers. And all of those are lifestyle illnesses. All of those aren't that you catch a bug and it gives you a heart attack. Oh, you get a virus and, you know, it make, gives you a stroke. They're all lifestyle degeneracies and much of it just comes from the things that we consider just fine well of course we eat meat we've always eaten meat. my family always ate meat and i do too and we eat it every meal and it's the main part of the meal and that's just the way life is and it's these it's these lifestyle choices that we that we make that creates these lifestyle diseases like stroke and and heart and you know those are things that are because of the way we live, because of what we eat, because of our lack of exercise, and because of our attitudes. Now, attitude is a very important thing with health. If your attitude is not fearful, if your attitude is positive, and you're not worrying about, is this a good thing to eat? Should I eat that meat or not? All these are worries. And all of that worrying will tend to make you not healthy. When you have a, a real positive attitude, that will keep you healthy more than anything else. Your, your immune system is directly connected to how you feel about yourself. If you're feeling very positive about yourself, then you have a much stronger immune system. You have a much stronger health. So a lot of it is just attitude. That's another lifestyle problem that leads to all those lifestyle diseases is that people tend to be very negative. They tend to, you know, complain and fuss and are annoyed and frustrated and they're, they have all this negativity. That's also part of their lifestyle. It's not just the food, it's, it's the negativity. 
So be positive, be cheerful, eat in moderation, don't overeat, stick mainly to a plant-based diet, and anything else you want to throw in there every once in a while, it's fine, it's okay. The meat occasionally isn't going to hurt you if it's just an occasional thing. If it's, uh, you know, if it's the main course, you know, you go into a restaurant and look at the menu and the menu is sorted by the meat that you get, you know, and then vegetables and anything else are kind of secondary. But you go there for the meat. Well, if meat is the, is the fundamental thing in your diet, then you probably over time will cause yourself some trouble. At least yeah, it, that's... The issue I'm dealing with is sort of that I, like, that I already learned not to like meat because I have been not eating it for such a long time. It's just like the question if it's smart to re-integrate in, in, it because it is healthy. Mm. So like to learn mm. to like No, that. I'd say if you're, if you're fine with not eating meat, then just don't eat it. It doesn't add a lot. It doesn't add a lot. Now, what you'll, what you'll hear from the meat industry is that you need, you know, 80, 90, 100, 120 grams of protein a day, but that's mostly nonsense. You don't need that much protein. 20 grams of protein a day is, is enough for most people. If you lift weights every other day or do something like that that particularly uses up protein, then yes, you might need some more, but uh, uh, 20 grams of protein is fine. It's all the body needs. You get little bits of protein from almost everything you eat. All those vegetables and things you eat have protein in them. Um, so, yeah, don't try, don't, don't be so um, moved by what other people tell you you should be doing. Do what comes natural to you, what feels right to you. If it feels good to you and you say, okay, I'm, I've, I feel good with this. You know, I'm eating mainly plant-based and, and uh, I feel good about that. And I'm not eating too much. And I'm not eating a lot of grease. Then just do that and feel good about it. And somebody else comes up and says, well, you know, you really ought to eat meat. You don't have enough protein. And, you know, unless you eat meat, you can't get any B, vitamin B12. Well, that's all nonsense. That's just belief. So eat what and be happy. If you're happy with what you're doing, it's going to be good for you. Be very positive. That's more important than the details. Do what you think is right and what feels good to you. And if that makes you happy and you're feeling good and everything's working, then go with that. Don't feel pressured by other people and their opinions. Have confidence that you know what feels good for you. Thank you very much, Tom. That was very helpful. Thank you, Carolyn. We'll move on to Abdul, who is coming in to us on microphone only. Go ahead, Abdul. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, Tom. Hello. Um, just a quick follow-up uh, from the last question before I move on to my primary questions. Uh, Tom, how have you found nuts reacting with your body? I mean, almonds, cashew nuts, walnuts, have you found them to be good, bad? Just, just one minute thoughts on that. I found them to be good, but not so much if you overdo it. So, you know, a few handfuls of nuts in a day, I think, are very good. All kinds of nuts, not just not just one. You know, if you just eat almonds and that's all you eat is almonds, that's the only nut, and you eat uh, you know four or five handfuls every day, you're probably overdoing it. But you should have lots of different kinds of nuts. So variety is important there because each variety brings some different kind of nutrient to your system. Um, variety is important in your food choices. If you just eat the same things all the time, that's not as good as if you eat varied things. So um, nuts are good. Seeds are good. That's not a, a, a problem, but don't overdo that. Um, what should I say? A handful a day? That's probably enough. But it's good to eat that handful a day. 
I wouldn't right. eat them. I, yeah, I wouldn't say uh, eat them all day long. Like if it's a thing that you just all constantly have around you and you eat it all day long, so you end up eating a pound of nuts every day, that's probably too much. But that's almost true of any food. You know, if all you do is eat carrots or, or all you do is, you know, eat heads of lettuce and you eat four or five heads of lettuce a day, you know, that's not so good. So no matter what the food is, too much of it, if you if your diet is, is basically made out of one food, that's not that's not good. So a handful, which I don't know how much that would weigh, but, you know, what you could fill up the palm of your hand with, that's probably enough nuts in a day. All right. Thank you. Um, so I will go to my primary questions now. Um, my first question is, how do you see the nature, role, and importance of, of power within the larger reality? Someone once said, God is God because he is the most powerful. It appears that power is a defining feature of reality. Does love have intrinsic value, or is it simply a means to the ultimate end of acquiring more power from greater entropy Okay. I just found your uh, written question. Your audio was a, was a little jumbled there. It was a little hard to understand. Um, power. How do you see the nature, role, and importance of power within our reality? Um, Power, let's just descri describe power as the ability to change something. Power can come from lots of different sources. If you are very, very wealthy and have a billion dollars in the bank, then that gives you a certain amount of power. If you are a politician and you are in charge of something, you run an organization or whatever, that gives you a certain amount of power. If you get rid of your fear, ego, and beliefs, that gives you a certain amount of power. So you can get power from, you know, in multiple ways. So power itself is not so much a is not so much significant in itself as it is how you use that power, what you do with whatever power you happen to have. That's what's important: is your intention. How do you use that power? So power, of course, is, is, uh, is important in our reality because power, again, means the ability to change, the ability to move things, change things. If you look at uh, social systems and see who were, the, who were the people who were really the most powerful in changing things, people who actually changed whole, um, you know, whole cultures, changed attitudes in, amongst millions of people. And you will find that some of those were perhaps using violence, but they didn't really change attitudes. They just forced people to do things the way they wanted them to do it. It didn't change attitudes at all. So everything was pretty much the same in people's minds but maybe they had to step and fetch according to the rulers. So you have that kind of power. It doesn't really affect much other than the way people act. So I would call that a very weak power and one that doesn't last very long. It comes and it goes. It doesn't really you know, leave much of a print. Time goes on and eventually those kind, that kind of power disappears. The, the power that uses violence and force, control, power, force, that power is ephemeral. It may last for, you know, 50 years. It may last for a century, you know, but mostly those things just come and go. They disappear and they don't leave that big a mark. Oh, they may leave some artifacts in among people like language or things, but they don't really change people that much. But look at the people who have been powerful enough to change whole chunks of civilization. People like Gandhi, Martin Luther King, you know, Nelson Mandela. What about people like that? See the changes they created. But they really created changes in people. Millions of people. Hundreds of millions of people. Made really big changes. Not just changes that are easily forgotten, but changes that move on because they actually changed people and their attitudes and their feelings. So that kind of power comes from the power of love, of caring, of getting rid of your fear, getting rid of your ego, 
These people were successful because they did not have fear, ego, and belief. That they were not dominated by those things. They may have had some of those things, but they weren't dominated by those things. So power comes, the, the power to actually change and make fundamental changes almost always comes from, from love, from, from caring, from seeing bigger pictures. And fear and belief and ego trap you in a small picture. You can only see small pictures. So a lot of the power that comes from force, control, you know, violence, that power can hold sway and can affect millions of people, but it doesn't really change anything. History swallows it up, spits it out, and it's just is something we read about, but it didn't change people. It forced people to behave differently, perhaps. It changed economics of a, of a region, perhaps, but not for long. When I say for long, I don't mean for you know, six months. I say you know, not for a century or two. Very seldom does it last that long. So as far as humanity goes, it's just not that important, not that significant. So that physical power, you know, Genghis Khan and his what, yellow horde, whatever, ran through, uh, you know, came out of the, came out of the east and, and overran you know, parts all the way in, you know, parts of Europe, Eastern Europe particularly, and a lot of others. And that changed a lot of things for those people for some time. So in a little picture, yes, it created great changes, but it didn't really change people. It didn't help anybody grow up. Matter of fact, it just perpetuated the control, power, force, ethic. So it was really part of the problem in the big picture, not part of the solution. So power can be, can be focused in ways that are not helpful, ways that are de-evolutionary. And power can be focused in ways that are evolutionary. So power isn't the key thing. It's the intent behind the power. Is that intention one of control, power, force, or is that intention one of caring, love, compassion? That's the difference in, in, in uh, the power. It's the, in, the intent behind the power. But power can be given just by... You know, numbers are powerful, big numbers. If you get 100 million people that uh, all have a very singular mind about something, then that's a lot of power, whether it's for good or for bad. You know, power is something that can change things. So numbers create power. Position creates power. Beliefs create power. You know, the, the clergy had power back in the 1500s because of beliefs. So lots of things can create power. But most power that turns out to be beneficial and, and, and actually makes changes to the side of, of good, to the side of people growing up, comes from love, and caring, and big pictures. All right. And uh, would you say that um, power plays a similar role in the paranormal as well, in the larger reality? Well, okay, people talk about paranormal things as powers. It's an ability to do something that otherwise you couldn't do, you know, that, uh, and I guess learning these paranormal things, if you, if you learn them just out of dogged perseverance and keep working at them and working at them, you can learn them to some degree, even if you have a negative attitude, even if you do have a lot of fear, ego, and beliefs, if you just put enough energy into it, you, you can do paranormal things, and you could use that for the power of force, you know, send me $100 a month, or I will make you sick, or I'll make your children sick, or I will kill, or I will do some other kind of thing. So you could use paranormal powers in a way that they were negative. So we call that, so we'd call that, tend to call that power. But if you use those paranormal things to understand people, to see bigger pictures, if you use them to be able to be more helpful in the world, to help solve, people prob solve people's problems, then we don't really call that power so much. But it is. It's the power to change things. If you have the power to change people, 
just because of your example or because that you can be helpful to them, then that is power. But in our world of control, power, force, or in our world of, of you know, high entropy, we pretty much see power as something that can force somebody else. And I guess that is power, but that's not the only kind of power. There's power that can help people change themselves. And I would say that's even a greater, a greater power. All right. So um, my next question is, um, so in your talk in Irvine, California, you said that highly evolved beings enter into various roles, such as becoming teachers and helping others evolve. Well, you also mentioned that you can become part of the big cheese. Can you please elaborate on this concept of becoming one with the LCS? Well, now the, the, the person I call the big cheese is not the same as the LCS. The big cheese is what I wrote in my book referring to the management, if you will, of end division and end division just being a big chunk of the non-physical that is that uh, of which our our virtual reality, our PMR is a part of that. So it was just the idea, the concept is that uh, wherever you have rules, then you have to have management. You have to have someone to, to uh, what, to make sure that those rules are followed or to maintain the rules. Because if you just make up rules, but if there's no management, then the rules just disappear. People just are however they are, do whatever they do, and you kind of lose the context of those rules. Well, the larger consciousness system has several experiments going on at the same time about how to optimize evolving consciousness. And end division, whose management is the big G's, is just one of those, you know, one of those petri dishes. It's just one of those petri dishes that uh, uh, has us in it, has this virtual reality in it. So that was the thought. So that's where the big G's comes in. So the big G's and the LCS are not one and the same thing. The, uh, you might say the big G's works for the LCS. But again, now these are all just metaphors. Don't take any of that too seriously. You know, these are just metaphors. Becoming one with the LCS is an experience it's a personal experience that you can have with the LCS. And it's one actually that many people, I shouldn't say many, but at least a, a, a large minority of the people who experience NDEs, near death experiences, some minority of those people have this uh, melding with the light. They see this. They see this light, and they get become enveloped with it. They become it. They they bond or, or meld with it, and in that experience, they feel nothing but love. They lose their own sense of self. They no longer have a self identification as me. They are everything. They are one with everything that is. And as their mind roams among all the things it is, among the grass and the trees and the animals and the people, they feel they are one with everything. They feel the only emotion and feeling they describe is love. Everything is just perfect the way it is. They feel connected to everything. And they have this experience, the, the, the melding or, or becoming one with the with the light. Well, the light and all that's just metaphor. That's the way we, we tend to translate that experience. We translate that experience into you know a being of light and so on. That's what we bring to it. But that's typically what is experienced. Now you don't have to have you don't have to have a near death experience to experience that. You know, anyone who knows how to meditate and can get into a, a meditative state where you lose your sense data. You're no longer processing sense data, a good meditation state. Uh, I call that point consciousness when you lose your, your sense data. Then you can request, you can ask the LCS, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to understand more of what love is and more of what you are. I'd like to connect with, with that. And just with that, intent, it is likely to happen. 
And if the system thinks that you're ready for that and that you would gain a lot from that experience, then it's more likely to happen than if you're just curious and, and uh, it still might happen, even if you're just curious, but then it'd be less likely to happen. So it just depends whether the system thinks that would be good for you. And when it does happen, it will be profound and it will change you. It will make, you know, it'll be a, like nothing you could imagine. It's nothing, and you know, I just described it a little bit, but hearing a description of it isn't even close to the experience of it. So that's the becoming one with the LCS. You become love. You want to know what is it like when you are love, when you've become love? Well, that's it. But the experience will last a while, and then it will disappear, and then you will be back to who you are. Now, you will feel changed by it. That uh, You're no longer who you used to be. You've, you're changed. But enough months go by, and you will kind of go back to who you are because that's not really who you were. That just was an experience that was given to you so you could see what it's really like to be love. You could, you could experience it. You could experience what it's like to be the LCS, if you want to put it that way. So that's what that is. That's the concept of becoming one with the LCS. It's a very profound, very beautiful experience. And you can, you can really have that as often as you like or as many times. Once you, once you develop yourself to the point where you can go make that connection, then it's just something that is available to you. You can go do that and have that experience. But the experience is so profound that you don't really want to do it like every day. It's not a thing in itself. It's a treasure that you, that you seldom partake of because it is so profound that it would almost be cheapening it and making it into something less than it is to do it, say, every day or all the time. That's not the point of it. The point of it is to let you see where you're going, what you're headed toward what it means to become love, give you that sense of something much bigger than yourself. Thank you so much. Armand, please go ahead with your question. Thank you. Hi, Tom. Hello. Um, I have a question uh, about Neuralink. It's a company founded by Elon Musk, and they're working on a device capable, capable of implanting uh, like threads in the brain and uh, uh, the interface could allow uh, people with uh, neuro neurological conditions to control phones and computer computers, but also uh, perhaps in the future cure dementia, Parkinson's disease, and uh, injuries injuries in the spinal cord. Um, it seems like inventions like these are uh, uh, here to come in the future and be more and more regular. I wonder if they can uh, hinder our uh, our uh, purpose in the PMR somehow if we change and manipulate uh, the rule set too much. I was wondering if the LCS uh, could uh, um, uh, um, intervene or block things like that if, if it can be somehow uh, negative for our uh, process as human beings on, on Earth when we um yeah find new technology like like this okay well the lcs can pretty much do whatever it wants this is a virtual reality and in a virtual reality uh the person that's that, that uh, runs the game you know the person that owns the server and owns the uh the game can do anything it wants to do within that reality so yes the lcs could block things that it found to be unhelpful that it could just create situations in which it didn't work for whatever reason, but it generally tends not to do that. It could, but it tends not to do that. It tends to let people do whatever people do. We have free will, and it tends not to want to get in the way of our free will. We're here to do things and to learn from them, and if the things we do turn out bad, then we're to learn from that and stop doing them. You know, but if they don't turn out bad, then we continue on. So that's just part of the process. So 
in that case, I'd say the LCS probably won't step in and do anything, but of course it could. It probably won't. It'll let us do pretty much whatever we want to with the idea that if we do things that are negative, we should learn and stop. And you don't, you can't, you don't learn from thinking about it. You learn from doing things. You know, you learn from making mistakes and learning from the mistakes. So now, what about these devices? You know, are they, are they negative? Well, could they be negative? Well, probably. Almost anything could be negative. You know, you can, you can do harm with almost anything. A hammer, you know, that hammers nails can be negative because you could hammer somebody in the head with it. You know, almost any tool could be used to some negative purpose. The point is that we, humanity, need to use the tool properly for good purposes. So if you're going to insert a chip in somebody's head and that helps somebody that has epileptic seizures control those seizures, well, that's a good purpose for a tool. Now somebody whose life is, is very difficult because they have a seizure, you know, every day or twice a day, and that makes it impossible for them to do certain things, drive cars, you know, hold a, hold a job, uh, be a brain surgeon, you know, there's, there's things that they just can't do now because they at any time may have a seizure. Well, that would fix that. That would give them a lot more decision space, the things that they could do. So that would be a good thing. Uh, if you use it to uh, control people, interfere with their free will, oh, that would be a bad thing. And we would learn that if you do that, it turns out poorly. The end result of that is not good. And then we should learn that and stop doing it if we start doing it. So basically, it's like any other tool. You know, as we develop technology, we change the way we interact with our reality and the way we interact with each other. We change, you know, technology changes things. We need to be able to grow up and become love and make good choices under any set of conditions. It's not like this technology will make us choose fear and whatever, you know, it's as, lo as long as we have our free will, then we will be able to evolve in a positive direction. If some kind of technology takes that free will away, like a like let's say a, a drug that makes you unconscious, when you're unconscious, then you don't make any free will choices. Well, that would not be a good thing just to make a whole lot of people unconscious, not because you're going to do an operation and it's a thing to keep them from having pain, but just well, that's that's how we'll deal with this this situation. We'll just you know put some kind of something in the water or something in the air and millions of people will become unconscious and then we'll have a, solved that problem. Well, that's a bad solution to that problem. That's not a good solution. And eventually that would lead to things that were worse, which would lead to things that were even worse, which hopefully eventually people would say, we don't want to go down that path. So technology isn't evil in itself. Technology isn't a bad thing. It's what do we do with the technology and how do we use it? So we ended up with a technology called the, you know, uh, uh, the fusion bomb, you know, the hydrogen bomb that can kill, you know, what, 100 million people in a half a second. It's uh, got a lot of power to be destructive. And we used it. And we did kill a whole lot of people in a half a second. So we haven't used it since. We, humanity, haven't used it since. And that's good. And if we never use it again, that's even better. But that's part of what we do. We do things and then we deal with the consequences of them. And by making errors and mistakes, we learn from it. So hopefully we will continue to progress in a positive direction and won't, you know, de-evolve to a point where we have to turn around and evolve back out of that hole. But if that's what we do, that's what we do. So if we were to have a big nuclear war and, and uh, kill a large part of the population and go back to living in caves, well, that's what we do. And then we start to evolve again from living in caves. It's, it's the way, you know, it's the way evolution works. So 
I think that such technology sounds like it has some promising positive effects, like helping epileptics, which is one of the things that that uh, I think it's it's focused toward. And if it strays into areas that are really non-helpful, then I suspect there will be people who will fuss and holler about that, and there will be commotion, and we'll think about it, and then we'll decide what to do, and then we get to make a choice and live with the consequences of that choice, and then maybe we'll make a better choice, and so on. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. It's uh, it's just technology. Yeah, I was also wondering about uh, this search after a prolonged lifespan and almost living, uh, being uh, immortal. Uh, yeah, can that be a problem? Yeah, it probably won't happen. I think that's a dream that some people have of, uh, you know, living forever, but that probably won't happen. And that's because the rule set, the rule set we have that basically is these bodies grew out of that rule set. And you can manipulate within the rule set. You can do all kinds of things within the rule set, but you can't make the rule set go away. And this is what is evolved here. And yes, we could learn, you know, we could have longer lives. But, you know, so people, you can make it maybe so people could live for, what, 120 years or 150 years. Because go back in time and people live for about 35 years. That was, that's what they estimate the lifespan was, you know, what, 100,000 years ago. People lived about 35 years of age and then they expired. There was so much violence and so much difficulty in, in just surviving that that's as far as most as the average person ever got. So we we have extended that lifespan significantly since then, from thirty five up to uh, what about eighty five or something is the is the kind of considered to be a long lifespan average somewhere near eighty. So in any case, we could extend it further. But making it to immortal, hundreds of years, you know, two or three, four, five hundred years, probably not. We'd probably find that that was dysfunctional. We'd probably find, even if we could do that, that it didn't work out very well. We would probably not be able to do that because the basic rule set wouldn't allow it. Probably wouldn't allow it. Now, there's all sorts of fantasiful things like taking our our mind, if you will, our consciousness and putting it into a robot. And then we could live in the robot's body, you know, for a long time, that sort of thing. Um, Well, consciousness isn't physical. Consciousness is non-physical. But you can make a robot that has a consciousness computer in its mind, then you can get a piece of consciousness to use that uh, that computer as its avatar. So maybe some of those things could actually happen if they turned out to be on our way to becoming love. But all of these things basically are just on our way to manipulating physical things. They really don't have much with us growing up. So my guess is that they will generally not happen out of choice. If we can evolve more quickly to a people that understands that we are to evolve to become love, and that's the important thing. That's what we're here for is is evolving the quality of our consciousness. Then none of those things will even be tried, even if they are possible, because they're not really pertinent. They're beside the point. If, on the other hand, we go that way and have not learned any of those lessons about what's the point of being here, and we think the point of being here is to live as long as you can and you know accumulate as much resources as you can, if we still have those kinds of ideas, then we will go as far as we go until we shoot ourselves in the foot and learn our lessons and have to go on. Or we could make our whole... You know, this whole uh, virtual reality, let's say that if the uh, if those that, that, that think that materialism is, you know, is the reality, 
rather than consciousness evolution, then that could bog us down to a point that there was very little growth. And the amount of, of, uh, of uh, the evolution of our consciousness would kind of stall out because we were so focused on the physical and on living long and doing other things, then this, this uh, virtual reality entropy reduction trainer would become less and less valuable and fewer and fewer would want to bother with it and the population would decrease and it would eventually hopefully fix itself or if not it would just be one of those that didn't work out and the system would turn its attention to those that would work out so all kinds of things are possible but from the system's viewpoint none of that is all that important in the sense that it's there's it always has choices it can always start another virtual reality it can always take this virtual reality at a certain point and restart it at that point hoping that it'll make different choices you know the system has so many choices that it's not going to hurt the system in the long term so consciousness will continue to evolve and that will be the fundamental you know reality of all existence is that we are evolving to to higher quality of consciousness that will still be there even if parts of the system become dysfunctional so we're going to make of it whatever we make of it we're going to have to you know we make the bed or what do they say yeah if you make make your bed and lie in it or you know you show the you have to uh, reap what you sow whatever the the sayings are, you know, we will create what we create. And we cannot force that to come out any differently because we will create something that reflects who we are, how evolved we are. So I would stay optimistic. I think we're going to eventually create something that's beautiful here, something that's that's really nice. And uh I think optimism is a better place to live than pessimism. Pessimism lives in fear. Optimism does not. So I'd be optimistic, but that's, you know, it's really nothing to worry about or be too concerned about. It is what it is. It's nothing that we can change. And yes, we can be part of that discussion. Is this an ethical thing to do? Or is this not an ethical thing to do? You know, we as humanity have already done that. You know, we've, We've talked about ethics. We even talk about the ethics of war. You know, yes, okay, war's about killing each other, but here are the rules, you know, how, how we can kill each other because this is ethical war rather than unethical war. So we have those discussions all the time about things like that. You know, it's cloning, cloning people. You know, is that an ethical thing to do or is that not an ethical thing to do? And we will work through that however we do, and then we will create whatever we create and that's the way it'll be. The larger conscious system will just keep on evolving as it as it can. We're not the only we're not the only virtual reality out here, you know, chugging along. So so I'm very optimistic. I think we'll do fine. We're uh, poised in the near future to grow up, and uh, that will change a lot of attitudes right now we see how much dysfunction we have in the world and if we progress that into the future well then you'd be a pessimist <laughs> you'd be you'd be very negative about the future because you can see what we've had you know we've, we've been living in warlord mentality for uh you know hundreds of thousands of years and uh, if that progresses and we have all this more, greater and greater technology and, you know, more ways that we can subdue and, and modify and, and restrict free will, then you'd come up with a really sad view of what the future is going to be like. But I don't think you should progress what we've seen into the future because we're evolving, we're changing. And I've seen a lot of change in humanity in the last couple of hundred years. I've seen even changes in the last year. So... I'm an optimist. You can't worry about the possibilities. Yeah, just live in your world. Do the best you can. Try to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem and let it go however it goes. Okay, thank you.
Tom Campbell here. I and MBT Events hope you like this video. We now have well over a thousand hours of free video on this user-friendly, ad-free YouTube channel. Though these videos are free to our viewers, they represent many thousands of hours in production and editing, and many thousands of dollars invested in video and audio equipment, along with the required computers and software to store and process the raw video into finished products. So far, all of this content has been funded directly out of our own pockets. Be assured, we will always continue to do what we can. It's our life, our purpose, a labor of love that we will continue to pursue as best we can. However, those pockets are not as deep as they used to be. Thus, we are now seeking to augment our resources with support from our viewers. If you find something of significant value in our videos, please consider supporting their production through our Patreon account or through a one-time donation. The links are in the description below. Thank you.